Hey, good afternoon, Florida. We are on with one of my very, very good friends, Mr. John Fisher. And uh, I chose John Fisher in the Recovery Broadcast Channel as one of the people I admire most. And he actually has more time than I do, I think. Um, and he's also a pretty smart guy. And uh, I want to thank him for coming on and then speaking today. And uh, John, you, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. And uh, yeah, it's been a great journey. And uh, it's been a lot of fun. And uh, I think I tell people all the time that uh, when I first got clean, that first white chip, I hit the lottery. I really did. And uh, my life changed dramatically. Uh, every time I go to meetings, I get paid. The life pays me. I mean, it's just, uh, I come from the school of hard work. If you work hard, you get paid. And not just money. I'm talking about in every way. And uh, I came in hot and heavy with this recovery. I didn't think I had a shot. I didn't know recovery was about. I didn't know about AA, NA, and, uh, you know, I'm really an addict that just uses the, uh, you know, the drug alcohol to come down, and it starts the mess, it's the beginning, the dominoes fall, and my big fat face is in a big bag of coke, and I'm smoking it, or <laughs> snorting it, or doing something with it, other than shooting it, thank God I had the fear of needles, cool. but, uh, you know, I went in for my recovery the same way, I hit a thousand meetings the first year, never went to treatment, other than wow. H. And I tell you what, that was the key to my success is uh, getting a uh, 13th step. That was another thing we'll talk about. But uh, she took me to a therapist and the therapist told me, um, uh, what are you doing with this girl? Long story short, I went to therapy real quickly. So even though I didn't go to treatment, I did get into therapy. And, and to me, I love therapy because you know what? She got in my face and it was a, a real important thing because I really did have all the answers. I had that opposite of the 10 step, which was like, I got all the answers. And I didn't admit when I was, I didn't probably have ever admit when I was wrong. And I certainly didn't even know what taking an inventory was about. But anyway, let's back up. Let's go to the beginning. you have any questions you want to ask me? And maybe we can go that way because I'll be all over the place. What was, uh, what was your last using experience? And uh, what happened to you that, uh, at that moment? Hmm. It's been 34 years. That's, that's a long, long time. Um, last using experience. Actually, I went out and drank a bunch of champagne. And um, uh, as I'm talking to you right now, I'm looking up on my 12-step uh, my app that I have uh, to give you exactly 40, let me see, 34.68 years, 416.20 months, 12,669 days. And it's funny when I see people picking up 30 and 60 and 90-day chips, I look at 12,669. I know you just celebrated 30 and we were joking about uh, a kilo chip. Somebody should make like a, a, thousand, uh, a 10 kilo chip, a 10,000 day. But anyway, um, I got drunk and, um, and I had stopped smoking coke for a long time. And then uh, I ended up getting drunk and I ended up going to see my dealer. And uh, it's kind of like crazy what happened. I ended up with this girl and uh, she pretty much died on me. And, uh, I was on top of her trying to pump her chest and trying to bring her back to life. And, uh, and I mean, I took maybe two or three lines and I was already paranoid. I mean, I used to get really paranoid towards the end. And, uh, I remember I bought a big gallon jug of gallo wine with a little thumb thing in it. So I could do like this. Cause I knew I was going to have to come down hard and I was feeling guilty because I had put a few days together. I actually picked up not an Amiti, but some guy gave me a chip and I remember, I was going to do it different. I was going to just do a cocaine white chip. And I remember putting the date on that cocaine, you know, doing it my way. On that cocaine white chip. Anyway, long story short, um, uh, I didn't believe in God in those days. And I remember looking up in the heavens and straddling her shoulders and thinking about the police coming in and busting me because it was my coke. She, the, the few lines she snorted from my coke um, was, was going to be what killed her. Anyway, long story short, I pray, God, please, I promise you, you know, that foxhole prayer. If, if she lives, I'll never do coke again. I swear to you, God, please, please. Wow. And, and I felt the wiggle underneath me. And I looked, and I had just bought an eight ball, and it was on my kitchen counter. And I got her up, and I took the eight ball, and I uh, threw it into a Ziploc bag. I've never in my life done something like that. Zipped it, handed it to her, and said, hey, here, it's yours, baby. Have a good time. And, wow. and that was it. And that was the last time ever. And uh, you know what? It's just like doing it my way and doing that uh, – thinking I can get away with drinking alcohol and alcohol has always been the first domino chip that falls. And I end up in that big bag of Coke. 
Yeah, Coke, uh, Coke was my friend too. That's a great story. Wow. So you had sort of a, it was like a spiritual awakening at that moment when you, uh, when she came back to life. It's, I always scared the hell out of me. With a, an unscrupulous character, to say the least. <laughs> Three in the morning. <laughs> wow, wow. One of my proudest moments. But you know what? Whatever it takes, you know, we always wonder how come people just never get it. And, uh, you know, the big book says they're constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And, uh, you know, it's just sad that some people just don't get it. But you know what? I think I had enough of a bottom to where I got it. And, you know, at that time I was uh, bleeding from my nose. I was bleeding from my, you know, when I brushed my teeth, it wasn't pink, it was blood. Uh, I think I was, when I went to the bathroom, I peed blood, I was shitting blood. I mean, it was bad. Yeah, it, was all, it, was, it was a lot of fun, right? Yeah, I mean, I was probably eating myself from the inside out. You know? uh, I didn't buy food, I bought drugs, you know. Wow. You know what? So let's I go. I, I've earned this chair. You know, John, it's funny. I know you pretty well. I know you're like, it's hard to believe that uh, somebody like yourself were in, was in the grips of something like that. But, you know, you, you, you wonder the power of something that we do that starts out as fun and then, you know, ultimately ends up to what you had just described. I mean, your physical, you know, your peeing blood, it's just terrible stuff. I mean, and then even with all that, it's, it's sometimes difficult to quit because that's the one you wonder why uh, other people can do it, but why can't I? And, but uh, it's amazing that you stopped, you know. What, 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 what happened next? Well, let's back up because that was the end. Uh, <laughs> you know, in the beginning, I started off with pot. I was a pothead, you know. And, uh, and, you know, it's funny. It ended up being a reservation at the end. I, I always said to myself, like, what the hell's pot going to do, you know? Sure. But I was buying back in those days, 34 years ago, the real expensive stuff. You know, uh, the stuff from uh, Micanope, uh, Florida, was being grown in the university, you know, and there was, like, powerful stuff back in those days. I remember the last time I smoked pot, I tripped. You know, and I know what tripping is. I've done a few trips, you know, and uh, I tripped on that marijuana. It was so damn strong. And I remember saying, I'll never do it again. So it was a progression. But let's back up to the beginning. I smoked pot, hash oil. In college, I smoked opium. I mean, not even knowing what the hell opium was. Uh, I had a 2S deferment. And, uh, and of course, I lost it because I flunked out of college. Vietnam War was going. I knew I was going to die in Vietnam anyway, so I might as well, you know, wasn't getting laid, wasn't partying, wasn't having a good time. All boys high school. Finally, I'm in college, and it's like, last thing I want to do is study. I want to go out and have fun because I'm going to die and be in one of those bags one day. So um, I went ahead, and um, uh, luckily, I ended up in the U.S. Army Reserves in the Basic training, I was smoking heroin, not knowing I was smoking heroin. And that was the big thing, the USO club, we'd have the dances and we had a lot of fun. I would cop pot from this guy and it was such a mellow pot. I didn't know what was going on. And I asked him one day and he said, oh yeah, we sprinkle some heroin on there. You know, heroin, he goes, yeah, heroin. So remember that back in those days, the monkey on your back from heroin. I never got the monkey on my back from that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I kept going back to cop pot from that guy, but I'm not, I'm not sure it was the heroin. But um, so we got there. I don't think I spent one day clean and sober in the Army. I mean, I was high every day I was in the Army. Uh, but, uh, you know, then I came home and I became a commodity broker and then I got into the music business. And that's when things really got bad. You know, I went from a pot smoker and, uh, you know, suddenly I'm snorting coke and, uh, and then uh, I, I get introduced to free base. And I was one of the first free bases in the neighborhood. I was free basing before Richard Pryor blew up. You know, so, I mean, I knew what that was. And we used ether, and it was dangerous as hell because, you know, the smokers didn't know any better. In the middle of doing some coke, you'd just light up a cigarette, and that ether would fill the room, and it would just, it would just blow up. Singe your no eyebrows, your mustache, whatever, it gets singed. But that free base was really, really bad. And then I was introduced to Quaaludes. And that's, I got a great Quaalude story, but we don't have time to talk about it. Uh, actually, I was like the girl. And, uh, and it was amazing. It was amazing. So she was like, a, I'm telling the story. She was a neighbor downstairs. Her, one of my best friends was her, her boyfriend. The guy never had sex with her. And then she would always come up and try to solicit us to have sex with her when he watched Monday night, whatever it was, football, baseball, whatever. No, 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 no. And she said, here, you're a big guy. I was a steel worker. I just lost my job. I was freaking out. I never took pills. And I said, here, take two of these. You're, you're a big guy. You're going to need these. And she gave me two quaaludes. And, within, and I'll be back in 30 minutes. And within... You know, 30 minutes and maybe 10 seconds from walking the door, we were in my bedroom. And uh, so she taught me this thing like these leg spreaders, Gorilla Biscuits, you know, the Aurora 714s, the Paris 400s, the 912s, the Sopers. 
Uh, I mean, that was it. And uh, just yeah, I mean, now, like now, they're getting the, uh, you know, the OxyContin taking 10, 15 a day. I, I ended up taking 15 a day. I had oh. six doctors give me 45 a day, uh, 45 a month, and 30 Ativan or 30 Valium, and doing an eight ball a day, and doing half a bottle of uh, Absolute, which I kept in the freezer. So I'm no lightweight. You know, I went through that whole craziness. And uh, again, it was a progression. Now we can go back to that story I told you about. But to imagine six different doctors writing you 45 a day and still having a cop at least 200 a month at oh. six bucks a piece. You know, that was pretty crazy. So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I pretty much went through the craziness. But you know what? I hate war stories. I want to talk about, like, the message. You know, yes. that's what I'm all about. When I share, I don't talk too much about my story. I talk about the steps. That's all I talk about the steps. And we all have a way of how we work the steps. And we all have our own interpretation. But, uh, you know, and I'm not one of these big book guys that's going to start quoting you in a big book. Although the old big book with the uh, page 449 uh, acceptance, I mean, that's like my favorite thing. I got one of those. Yeah. But let, let me tell you something. Um, when I first got clean, I went to AA because there wasn't a lot of NA meetings. And then the AAs actually helped us start NA meetings and we got pretty crazy with you know NA meetings in Dade County Florida and uh, you know as years went on I, I started getting more and more pissed off at the rebellious you know fellowship and the way they disrespected the mothership I mean after all it was the uh, it was the actual uh, AA that started everything and it was like how I got clean and those alcoholics had a lot of you know a lot of patience with me and uh, and I really resent it that they were actually saying bad things about it. And, you know, guess who started the whole thing? It was AA. I don't want to get into controversy, but it's my experience. And, uh, you know, I got chased out of, you know, myself. I just said, I'm out of here. And I went to AA meetings, and then I get a little tired of the AA message. And then, well, let me go back because I'm really an addict. And then more, you know, then they started put $2 in the basket, and then they started with the wee shit, and it's part, part of my language. But, you know, recovery is recovery. And, uh, you know what, when you start talking about another addict, an alcoholic is an addict who abuses the drug alcohol. And you know, how loving, how spiritual is that? And you know, I'm not a spiritual giant, but I can tell you one thing, man. Uh, you know, when you start persecuting or you start giving people problems about what fellowship they go to, and to be so narrow, closed-minded to think that the only therapy I need are the 12 steps of Narcotics Anonymous. You know, I mean, I go crazy because without therapy, I would have never made it. And there's not one sponsor I've ever had that ever dug as deep and broke me out of and broke me through so many different things. Breakdown, breakthrough. That was my therapist. And it, it wasn't happening in, uh, in sponsorship. Uh, I had an AA 40-year sponsor who was great. I fired him because he was sponsoring two guys. We were both dating the same girl. And I got mad at him because he should have told the other guy to back off my girl. I mean, that's how sick I was in the beginning, you know. But he still helped me a lot. And, you know, everything happens for a reason. But, you know, today, you know, if there was a Kryptonite's Anonymous, it's the same 12 steps. And to me, I don't care what the first step is. To me, it's like the 12 steps. And you know what? AA made that contribution. There's 240 some odd fellowships. And believe me, I've been to All Readers Anonymous. I love Al Anon because, you know, I got to deal with other alcoholics like you. And uh, my friend Willie, we have a common friend Willie. Yeah. That, that we need a lot of uh, a lot of uh, Al Anon to deal with him, and he's been a great teacher. I mean, you know, I'm a controller. Do what I tell you to do, and you won't suffer so much. And all that craziness not only helps me with my relationships, my my girlfriends, but all my other relationships. Uh, you know, Gamblers Anonymous. I mean, I'm not a gambler, but I I could very well become one. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's all there's all kinds of different addictions that we have. Uh, I remember going to Sex Anonymous one time, but <laughs> not for recovery, but bad boy. But bottom line, bottom line is, uh, let's talk about the steps. You know, the first step for me was really easy. And I got that first step done out there. See, I did my research and development out there. Once I start, I can't stop, you know? And, uh, you know, we, were, we admitted we were powerless over our addiction, alcohol, whatever, I don't care. We admitted we were, I like addiction because it covers everything. It's kind of weird. You know, narcotics has a lot of, like, weird stuff in there that's kind of weird. <clears throat> up with it, you know, and they say our addiction. I like that word addiction because it's everything. Mm -hmm. You only talk about drugs, uh, even though it's total abstinence. But uh, you know what? In the Narcotics Anonymous uh, literature, I never see anything about uh, codependence. Never see anything about codependence. And, and you know what? As you put years on, it's the codependence that takes you out. 
I mean, that stuff is deadly. And yeah. never, really, you know, I go to people and I see people in NA lose their homes and I see the gambling addiction. Again, I'm not an angel. I think the only vice I have is I smoke cigars. And, and, and you know what? I didn't smoke a cigar this morning. I haven't smoked a cigar in two days. You know, I go the whole week and maybe Friday night I'll smoke one. Maybe when I do a project, I'll smoke one. But as soon as I feel like it's become an addiction and I wake up in the morning, I got to light one up. It's a problem. I got to drop it, you know. But uh, to me, you have to maintain an open mind. And it's not just the powerlessness over my drugs and alcohol. But it's powerless over anything. Anything that I get hooked on, I got to let go. So that first step was easy. Again, I did it before I got here. We we're powerless. What does powerless mean? Powerless means that once I start, I can't stop. Hey, one thing about me, I'm a keep it simple guy. Keep it simple, stupid. And, you know, don't complicate it. And it works for me. I'm a caveman, you know, so that works for me. Once I start, I can't stop. I've learned that over and over again. I told you in the beginning, I had all the champagne at the disco place. I was a disco duck. I'm drinking the champagne. I go to the bathroom. I didn't really finish the story. I go to the bathroom all drunk because I thought I could keep drinking. And I'm in the, at the urinal. And the guy whips out a plastic bag with a straw in it. And, and I don't know how he could tell I spoke Spanish, but he's in Spanish. Well, it was a Spanish disco. He hands me the bag. He says, hey, you want some? And I go, no, 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 I don't do that. And before I pulled the zipper up, I had the bag in my hand, and I was snorting it. And the, the Coke sucked. And uh, I got in the limousine, and I drove to my connection, and, and, and I copped. You know? and, and the lesson was that alcohol, the alcohol. Once I start, I can't stop. So uh, that step was really, really easy for me. The unmanageability, I mean, uh, having the rent in your top dresser drawer and just saying to yourself, well, I'll just buy more Coke. And then when the landlord comes, I'll give him some story and I'll make the money next week and, and whatever. You know, just spending the rent, you know, your health, uh, losing jobs, losing relationships, your relationship with your family. You know, the unmanageability is very, very simple, you know. Um, the second step, uh, you know, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. For me, that's, that, that, that step was easy again, because I had a good sponsor. And again, I kept it simple, stupid. The word insanity, I looked up. You know, the dictionary was important. I had to look up some of these words. And, and I was poking holes in a program, but they were also making sense to me. So the insanity is doing the same thing over and over again. And I related to that because, you know, I really thought I could stop. And I didn't stop. Man, the number of pipes that I broke, I could tell you, I'll tell you a great story. I was coming out of my addiction and I, and I was living in this townhouse and it was almost like a crack house. I was like, I took all my friends, I was dealing with drugs and I was dealing coke and I was like, all my powder guys, I turned into crack addicts and I increased my business dramatically. And of course, there was no profit. I was smoking the extra coke that was being made from, from the pipe. And uh, so I moved to this two bedroom right on the water. It was beautiful in North Miami, Ziploc Lane. I could walk to my connection. It was like the most concentration of coke dealers in a, a one mile stretch. But I was overlooking this canal. And I remember after I finished smoking, I would take the, uh, the, the pipe, fill it up with water and say, that's it, I'm done. I'm not doing this anymore. And I knew I wasn't crazy enough to jump in the canal and get that pipe. So I would throw it into the, um, into the canal. Also my absolute bottles. I didn't want people seeing me put the abs empty absolute bottles in the dumpster. I fill those things up with water and throw them in the, uh, in the canal, I would throw, throw the dumpsters in the, uh, the, I would throw the dumpsters in the pipe. I would throw the pipe in the dumpsters and get into the dumpster two, three in the morning and recover that pipe again. Oh. And uh, you know, so it was like that middle of the night stuff that not being able to fall asleep. Uh, let me, let me roll forward to, uh, I'm clean. I don't know, two, three years. I have a little speedboat, a uh, little 19 footer checkmate with a 235 Evinrude engine on Davids, drop it. Beer Can Alley, skiing our ass off. I remember above the window and tying it up, and I had a scraper, and I was taking the, the barnacles off it. I dropped the scraper, and I went to the bottom of the canal, and I looked down, and I saw all the empty absolute bottles, and I saw all the pipes, and I said to myself, man, there must be somebody else in the building besides <laughs> me that's filling up these absolute bottles full of water. It was, like, it was scary looking down. And seeing all the absolute bottles all over the place it was crazy. Oh. Um, third step, made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood Him. I'm a nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn. You know, it's like I kind of like wasn't down with the religion. You know, I don't like religion. I mean, I'm proud of being a Jew, and I'm never giving that up. But 
the religion part of it is kind of like where all the trouble comes in. And I love the concept that, that this program was giving me, a, a higher power, a God of our own understanding. I had a problem with my God because of the Holocaust. I was like, where the hell were you when all that stuff happened, you know? And uh, so I always had a, an excuse not to believe in that God. So I had to actually you know, I had to invent a new God that had nothing to do with that. I mean, it was about self-preservation. And, and I was listening to what these people were telling me. I mean, I heard about the agnostics, and I heard that chapter in a big book. You know, there are agnostics that do make it, but I didn't think it was going to work for me. I used to always say to myself when I was uh, getting high that God loved me because he didn't need me because I was taking care of myself. And uh, if there is a God, he'd love me because I took care of myself. And one day I saw that footprint prayers and I'm like, holy smokes. <laughs> I mean, I felt like a real fool, but you know, that's what we do. God carried me through that whole craziness. But uh, I knew I had to make that decision. And you know, they said, make a decision. They didn't say believe. They said, make a decision. And if you really study these steps, they're so hip. Uh, I mean, it's dynamite, you know. Um, you know, um, on the second step, it says, uh, came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And I used to hate that could. I used to say, why not would? You mean there's a chance here that it may not happen? And then you go to AA. And you know, all is good because I could look at the AA version, the NA version. And then from the two different writings, I could go ahead and make my own conclusion. AA's got a lot of good stuff in it. NA has a lot of good stuff in it. But, you know, AA with that, you know, there's those few unfortunates that seem, seem to be constitutionally incapable of, of being honest with themselves. That made a lot of sense to me, man, because as I was coming up the ranks and I was, you know, class of 84, I saw a lot of relapse, a lot of relapse, mm -hmm. especially in, in N.A. And I was wondering, like, why these people were relapsing. And then I would say, wow, this guy's or this girl's constitutionally incapable of being honest with her, themselves, not cash register honesty, but that honesty. So anyway, that's one of the things that was like, could, would, how come they didn't do would, you know, and then how come they used powerless over our addiction instead of power, powerless over narcotics. Alcoholics Anonymous, powerless over alcohol. Narcotics Anonymous, powerless over narcotics. But they were hip and smart enough to stay addiction, yet they didn't follow through with the rest of the book with addiction. It was always about drugs. Yeah, total absence. Alcohol is a drug. But what about the rest of the addictions, you know? So I knew I had my work cut out to me because it wasn't going to just be drugs and alcohol. You know, the fourth step, you know, that inventory is like, um, it, it was scary because everyone was talking about the inventory. And I still have my first fourth step. And uh, <laughs> it's in my bathroom. And it's not even my first fourth step. It's my yeah. girlfriend. Hey, did I tell you I was 13 steps? <laughs> you mentioned that earlier. But yeah, I, I don't know you're going to tell us about it. Yeah, I was working in this uh, boiler room. And uh, everybody told me that uh, when uh, the N.A. girls stopped taking drugs, all they want to do is have sex. Okay. Hey, whatever works, you know, work for me. And yeah. uh, I got the, I met this one little sissy space, a beautiful, sick ticket, but such a little hottie. And, um, oh, my God, I became the uh, second step poster child of um, Narcotics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. And I kept coming back for more. She took me to the therapist. After 10 minutes, she walked out and said, F you. And the therapist asked me, what are you doing with her? And I'm like, man, this is dirty. This is your customer. You know, this is your patient. And you're, you're telling me, what am I doing with her? And I remember I looked at her and I said, I love her. And I remember when I, that L rolled off my tongue. I looked at her eyes. I looked at her eyes and she said to me, love, do you know what love means? And I'm right. like, oh boy, here we go. I messed up here. Then she threw me the uh, Scott Peck, um, um, uh, um, what was the, uh, the road less traveled she gave me. And then, uh, she started throwing the literature at me. And I got to tell you that road less traveled is not approved literature, but uh, I'm telling you that it's a very, very important part of my recovery. Hmm. And, uh, and it helped a lot. And she started, you know, teaching me about love or whatever. I went five, six years with that girl. I didn't learn my lesson. It took me a long time. And, you know, I should have gone to Al on means back then, but I wasn't ready. I didn't know what codependency was because I was such a NA guy. And I never heard, never heard anyone sharing about it, nothing, until later on I got into AA and started hearing the A's talking about Alan Donald. But, uh, you know, I, I made that, that first one was bad. But you know what? My sponsors always told me that if you're in January, your second year of recovery, you're in your first step. If you're in your third year of recovery and it's April, you're on your fourth step. So that you didn't run through the 12 steps one time and it was over. 
you know, it was like something that you continue to do. And on your second, third, or your fourth, fourth step, God will reveal things to you that it's time for you to go ahead and, uh, and be aware of. And uh, you know what? On my fourth, fourth step, there was a part there. And I had this killer, even though I was an NA, we got this AA four-step guide that was 28 pages long <laughs> that turned over every slimy rock. There was just no way. Wow. You weren't stay clean and clean house and trust God after doing that stuff. And I remember, I still have one right here. And uh, that's the ones we, they say, oh, that's not NA approved literature, you know, and I, I don't care about NA approved. It's going to, they invented the things. How do you tell me that you can't use their stuff if they invented the program, you know? So uh, anyway, we did that. And I remember that part. My, my father and I were friends for a long time and then we became friends and then he was diagnosed with cancer. And I remember he turned me on to a, a $5 Quaalude connection where Quaaludes were going for six. So that was really cool. And he was trying to reach out to me, trying to take care of me. Then all of a sudden he's diagnosed with lung cancer. He was a cigarette addict, cigarette addict, three, four packs a day. And I remember being at the grave when he was getting buried and almost falling in the grave from being so high on Quaaludes, you know? And I remember that, you know, I had to make my amends to that. And I did, I put like a four or five year chip on his gravestone. And that's how I made my amends to him. But, uh, you know, the, um, the fifth step was funny. We got a guy locally down here. He's like a real, uh, <laughs> his name is Paulie. I'll, I'll give him up. I won't tell you his last name, but he was, he had the audacity to say, to have stickers made that another friend of Paul E's instead of Bill W. And boy, oh boy, was that controversial. And, but I love that guy. Cause you know, we worked together in the boiler rooms and I related to him. And, uh, I had a sponsor who was uh, drinking the whole time he was sponsoring me. And, uh, when I had that fourth step and, and I wanted to share the fifth one, the first one, um, uh, you know, uh, Paul E did the first fifth step with me and I showed him that same four step that I have in my bathroom that I read every once in a while when I'm making a duty because it's so funny. And uh, he says, give me this thing. He says, he touched my heart. He said, okay, give it to me from here, you know? And I pretty much just did it. And, and I remember he came up to me and he said, are you holding back on anything? And I'm like, I don't trust you. I'm not telling you my secrets. And it's like, well, listen to this. And he started sharing some stuff, which I won't tell you, but he was telling me some like bad stuff. And I was like, I interrupted him. It's like, wait, 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 let me tell you about me. I've got, you know, all this. <laughs> now, I don't know, because I gave some false information to see if he threw my stuff out in the street. But you know what? I never put his stuff on the street. He never put my stuff on the street. And I remember the relief I got from sharing that, that fifth step, admitted to God, that another person, ourselves, the, the exact nature of our wrongs. And uh, I know I use some real graphic, you know, I mean, I'm a video kind of a guy. I mean, everything is video for me. And uh, it's like a sticky, filled up toilet that you flush the toilet and it's clean when you're done. You know, no more stink, no more, yeah. It's like, you know, and I knew I had to keep maintaining it because the mm -hmm. next one of the steps talked about that. But that sixth step, you know, to me, um, to become aware of what my character defects were and to be willing, you know, to, to get, you know, to, to, to do it and then to get humble enough to, to uh, to ask God to remove these defects of character. Again, it's part of that cleaning house, you know? I didn't know what the hell a defect of character was, you know? And I, and I knew I had a lot of them and the, my jealousy was out of control. I was, I got some bad stories about jealousy. And because uh, my father was always jealous of my mother. And I don't think they even invented lesbians back when I was a kid. <laughs> I don't know if they even had lesbians, but my father accused my mother of being a lesbian because her girlfriend, Paula, you know, was like, Oh, you're having, she's a, le your girl, your lesbian girlfriend, Paula. And I saw this stuff. I grew up in Cuba the first 10 years of my life. I went through that whole Latin machismo, you know, cheat on them before they cheat on you. I mean, I had some really, really bad, you know, data in the beginning of how everything was supposed to be. And this therapist, Shotzi Casal, man, she was the best. She was in North Miami. Uh, she really, really, really helped me a lot. Same thing back seven, um, you know, having God remove these defects of character. Back then, what we did was we went to, um, we bought poker chips, red, white, and blue ones. We went to Office Depot, we got the little white stickers. On one side, we put the defect of character. On the other side, we put the answer to it. So like fear would be faith and so on. And then we'd throw them in a jar, we'd mix them up every morning. And before we left the house, we'd take that chip with us. And I was a fidgety kind of guy, so I was always playing with that chip. And I think after for the first 12 months, I went back into that jar of, of chips because I had worn out some of them because God had made me pull that chip, or God didn't make me, 
I happened to pull that chip out, and I believe it was God saying, yeah, I think we'll work on your jealousy today. <laughs> and, and I had two fears, and I had two jealousy chips, and they were worn out. There were some chips that I never even pulled out of there. It was just like, and it was a fun way of doing it. Later on, we went to the casino in the Bahamas, and uh, I remember getting real chips, the real silver ones, and putting the stickers. And I still got some of them laying around, but that was a fun way of working on your character defects. And, uh, and, and it's something that I don't hear about anymore. And it's fun, man. It's like allowing God to pick that character defect for you on a daily basis. And then during the day, you know, play with it. The ninth, st the eighth step to me, you know, making a list of people we had harmed and, and became willing to make amends to them all. You know, the ninth step. Again, cleaning house, you know. And, uh, and to me, I, I made that amends. I mean, there were some people I couldn't make the amends to. Uh, I couldn't tell Keith about Theta and that. Well, you know what? He found out. I told him about it. But, um, you know, there were some affairs I had that I shouldn't, I shouldn't have. And uh, even though I always had bro code, never really messed with married women, uh, I wouldn't wait too long till you broke up with your girlfriend before I ended up with her. You know, I mean, that's just the way it was. And uh, it was pretty crazy back in those disco days, you know, uh, with the Gorilla Biscuits. We used to call them Gorilla Biscuits, the Quaaludes. We used to call them leg spreaders. Uh, I'm just telling you, man, that was a crazy, crazy time. Probably what I hear like the roofies are now but everybody was taking money. I, mean, I saw what happened to Bill Cosby and deep down I'm saying to myself, my God, that was the culture. I mean, I got, it. the girl gave me two quaaludes and had her away with me. So it was like, but everybody did. Everyone took quaaludes and did coke and got crazy. But the, I know Bill Cosby took the heat for, a, he, he's the savior. He's going to take it. Mm -hmm. um, it was really, really a, a bad scenario, but getting to that eight step, I made that list. I made sure to put myself on that list. And, uh, and I made the amends wherever possible. There's a couple of amends that I couldn't make, but as I said before, I went to the grave and I, um, and I took a chip and I put it on my father's headstone and said, hey, Pop, you know, I'm clean. You know, and I'm sorry I wasn't there for the funeral. I'm sorry I wasn't there for you when you were going through the cancer. But I just said to myself, man, after all those years not having you, now I'm going to just jump in while you're going through like the worst part of your life, you know. And, you know, he wasn't even there. He lost his mind. Uh, <clears throat> ten step. Continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. I love that. And you know, I have a computer program that says, F you, I'm right, you're wrong. And that program had to be, you know about that. You've got that, you know? <laughs> that's, why, that's why I'm laughing, my friend. <laughs> and I worked together on a couple of projects. And you know what? It's so easy to see his stuff. It's a lot easier to see my stuff. But, you know, we are both strong-willed. And I got to tell you. Hey, it's fun, though, isn't it? No. But anyway, <laughs> but the, I need a new sponsor. But the bottom line is, you know, that I'm right, you're wrong. And you know what? There's a relief that comes with admitting when you're wrong. I'm not talking to you. I'm talking for myself. Mm -hmm. you know, when I make a mistake, there's like a human part of that. You know, like I want you to forgive me when I do something wrong. And I'm not perfect. But, you know, it's another reason, the opposite, that I have to accept the men's. And I will accept your amends, but I'm not necessarily sure that I'm going to be your friend if, if you're toxic and if you're the kind of guy that's just going to do it again anyway. Now, how do I know that? I don't Listen, I have the right of who I choose to be in my life and who not. And, you know, I tell people, especially people in the program, when I want to get rid of them, I'll say, hey, listen, I had a really good week. I know you're hurting for money. Come on by for a couple of hundred bucks, man. Just pay me back as soon as you can, you know. And you never see them again. So, I mean, no. if you never want a way of getting rid of somebody who's toxic in the program or in life. Let them a couple hundred bucks. You'll never see them again. It really, really works. But either that or I, I make them invisible rather than get into like, you know, and I've been disrespected a couple of times. And that's the big thing is respect at meetings. And I had this one guy when I was picking up, I don't know how many years, Chip. Uh, I chose not to kick his ass. And I told him he was lucky that I, was a spiritual, that I had a spiritual program and I don't do that anymore. But a couple of days later at another meeting, some guy was picking up an eight-year Chip and the guy flat out knocked him out. And uh, knocked him out. And then when he called the cops, they tried to interview everyone in the meeting. And everyone in the meeting said they didn't know what happened. Because this guy was just a cross talker. He was known for that. Oh. I don't wish it upon him, but he ended up dying from lung cancer. But, uh, you know, you don't, have to, um, you don't have to do that. You don't have to have those people in your life. You can just make them invisible and choose not to have them in your life. Uh, so that 10 step, to me, I love it. You know, and, and, and doing that promptly, I don't want to carry the resentment. And I got to really... Anytime something goes on in my life, I always take a look at my side of the fence. And I even put myself in your place and look at me, how I'm showing up in front of you. And that helps me a lot. Again, I visualize things. It makes it much easier. Everything in my, in my brain, when I look at something, it's all 
it's all video. I can actually see the video going on. Um, the um, eleventh step was that uh, magical mystery tour, man. I mean, that's a <laughs> tough one to explain to anybody. Um, you know, uh, uh, continue to take personal. Uh, no, that's the other one. Uh, continue through prayer and meditation to reach a higher conscious contact with God as we understood Him. Praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out it becomes automatic. But the, you know what? You know, God's will for me again, caveman. Keep it simple, stupid. God wants me to be joyous, joyous and free, you know, happy, joyous and free. Doesn't want me to suffer and doesn't want me to be on the hook. And I don't even know who my God, he, she, I don't know. It's just a power. And, uh, you know, to me, that uh, that magical mystery tour that, you know, praying only for knowledge of his will for us. Well, I already know what God's will for me. But the bottom line is that uh, um, when I take a look at, they say you're not supposed to pray for stuff. I pray for stuff all the time. And then I beg God to take it away from me, you know. So I got a real good relationship with my God. I'm crazy about my God. My God's crazy about me. And I can tell you so many stories. I mean, I had a six-tuple bypass in 2001. You know, I'm, I'm like, uh, you know, uh, 50 years old, and, uh, and I died. I died on the table. I've had skin cancer for, for 40 years now. Uh, I had a stroke two years uh, two years ago. Uh, I had a colonoscopy because I really am health conscious. Right? I make sure I take care of my health. And, and they said to me, uh, don't take your baby aspirin for seven days before, seven days after. Eight days, I stroke. You know, and I drive myself to the hospital. They give me that TPA shot, and I get it all back. My whole right side was gone. And, and if that's not God working, God saves me for a reason. And you know what? As crude or whatever you think of <clears throat> message of what you're getting out of the message I'm giving you right now, someone's getting something out of this. I know I'm that powerful, that maybe one or two guys or girls are relating, are understanding, and they're getting this message, you know, they're getting it, you know, and, uh, uh, and I love this program. I think this program is a gift, and it'll work on everything. I think we should have been taught this in school, instead of the Treaty of Versailles being 1812, or whatever the hell it was, that's information we don't need, you know, this is this should be life anonymous. We're powerless over life, and our lives have become unmanageable. And we should all have 12-step programs. But the last one, and I'm done, is um, 12 steps. And you know what? Um, having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we tried to carry the message to others and practice these principles in all our affairs. Tried. What the hell's up with that try? I mean, we try to help others, you know? I hate words like that, but I got wisdom as the years went on, and I realized that you could carry the message, but that's all you could do. You could just tell them, but they're not going to necessarily do it or take your advice. We're all stubborn, and we all have to go our own path, and that's what the path is. So, you know, bottom line is um, I love this program, and uh, the biggest gift I've ever been given in my life is my biggest accomplishment. The IRS, the DEA, the FBI, you can't touch this shit because it belongs to me. I've earned it, blood, sweat, and tears. And uh, what a gift, you know? So, um, yeah, I'm a happy camper. Uh, I'm a happy uh, customer. And uh, I'm going to keep doing this one day at a time. And I really hope I help you guys out. And I know I didn't give you a chance, as usual, to talk, John. Have you got any other questions? Uh, no, buddy. I just want well, to say thank you and, and let you know that, you know, there is one person right here live that is talking to you that is getting something out of this. I get something out of it every day with you. Uh, you are a great example of how this works. You are, uh, what, what, I, what I got out of what you said was some of the things you did may not fit into the normal recovery. Like you, know, you saw outside help with a therapist and, and different things. You know, there are certain things that, you know, uh, our message of recovery is, is, you know, the reason for this recovery broadcast channel, as I said to you, was it seems like the message has kind of lost its its way. It's sort of it's jumped off the track, you know, with the rehab uh, ban bonanza and all this other nonsense. But I appreciate, you know, uh, you kind of hit it right on the nail as far as the message goes. You went down the steps uh, is the way you understand them and the way they're written. And uh, I do like 10. I mean, owning it is everything. You know what I mean? Um, you know, when you and I talk to each other, I may not, you know, we, we butt heads, but in the end, you know, owning your stuff, admitting you're wrong, uh, me admitting I'm wrong, and then compromising, I mean, that's kind of how life is, right? Yes. And I don't want to thank you very much for uh, taking the time out today. 
and speaking to everybody out there and, and, and being part of my recovery. Uh, I, I appreciate that. All right, buddy, when you get a chance, call me back. Let's talk about dinner tonight. <laughs> John, take it easy. All right, bye. You got it, bye.